Praise the Lord, everybody, and everybody praise the Lord. Welcome to In Heavenly Places with Elder Marcus Brantley, and I am yours truly, Elder Marcus Brantley, and I am glad that you are taking the time out to hear a word from the Lord. And we do have a word on this evening, as we always endeavor to do. And I'm just thankful uh, to the Lord Jesus Christ, who through the Holy Spirit gives me the illumination and the understanding of his word that I made then impart it to you uh, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So we're going to look at a passage of scripture. And before we actually do that, um, let me just say that um, I did miss you on last Sunday. I was traveling. Uh, as some of you know, I posted uh, that I was um, celebrating my uh, 22nd wedding anniversary. And I'm also thankful to the Lord Jesus Christ, how he has kept my wife and I together in the beauty of matrimony. And um, I'm just forever grateful uh, for his presence, even in the midst of things when uh, things don't necessarily uh, go uh, the way you want things to go. But in the final analysis, uh, God has kept us and we're so forever grateful. So um, as I stated earlier, we're going to look in uh, the book of Romans, the fifth chapter, that's Romans chapter five in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're going to commence reading at verse six. And the word of God reads accordingly. For when we were yet without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet peradventure for a good man, some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only so, but we also joy through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. Father, in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, Lord, we thank you, we praise you, we magnify your name. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to share from your word. We thank you, Lord, for you are the word, for the word was with you in the beginning, for the word was God, and the word was with God, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Father, you said, lo, I come in the volume of the book, it is written of me to do thy will, O Lord. O God, speak, Lord, through your manservant. Open thou our eyes that we may behold the wondrous things out of your word. O God, enlighten us, Lord, by the power of the Holy Spirit. O God, let your word, Lord, be like a hammer that breaketh rocks or stones into pieces. O God, convict the heart, Lord. O Lord, let there be a change in someone's life. O God, let there be healing in someone's body. Oh, in the name of Jesus, Satan, we come against you. We bind you in the name of Jesus. For the Lord said, whatever we loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And whatever we bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. We bind everything that's not like the Lord. We bind everything that is evil, every doubtful spirit. Oh, every depressing spirit, we come against it. We plead the blood of Jesus Christ. Father, have your way. Bless each and every hearer on this platform. Oh, God, let them leave energized, giving you glory and honor, for you are worthy of the praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Looking at verse 11. Well, let's look at 10 and 11. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. Amen. And my thought on this evening is simply Jesus paid it all. 
Amen. Jesus paid it all. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Let's just let that marinate for a little while, that Jesus paid it all. Because imagine if you were in debt and you received word that somebody paid your bill. Now that's with respect to money and your debt being paid. But what about your life and the debt levied against your life? For the Bible says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. But here someone has paid the debt of death on your behalf. In other words, Paul says, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Hallelujah. Sometimes when we read the scriptures or when we hear the scriptures, we have a tendency to move past it pretty quickly rather than meditating on it. Try to fully grasp and discern the spirit that is in the word. Amen. Because the word has spirit. For the letter killeth, but the spirit giveth life. Amen. And when I look at this text, Jesus paid it all. It's paying a special attention to the word atonement, which is found in verse 11. The atonement. We receiving the atonement. And the relevance of that word atonement has to do with a celebration or rather a commemoration because the day of atonement was just took place on last Thursday or rather last Wednesday, this past Wednesday is not a, necessarily a celebration, but it's a commemoration. It is a feast of the Lord in which they are to afflict their souls. Other feast days, there is a celebration where there is not the afflicting of one soul. It doesn't involve fasting and praying. And yes, in others, it does involve praying, but it's also a celebration. Amen. And this past Wednesday, the Jewish world commemorated uh, the Feast of the Day of Atonement. And as I always say, you, you're probably thinking in your mind, well, there Elder Brantley goes again talking about the feasts of the Lord. But I, it's important for me to reemphasize because the feasts of the Lord are a very understated principle in the word of God that in Christendom is not taught enough because it's an Old Testament principle. Uh, it's an Old Testament subject matter. And because it largely dealt with the children of Israel and their responsibilities with regard to keeping those feasts, nevertheless, the feast provides a framework, a roadmap in which God would use these feast days as appointed times to work his will or his plan of salvation. And when you actually study and come to understand what these feasts represent, it gives you a timeline of where we were as the people of God, where we are, and where we are going. Amen. Because there are the fulfillment of these feast days, there is the fulfillment of these feast days that have already occurred. And then there are remaining feast days that have yet become or have yet to be fulfilled. And last week, when we talked about the Feast of Trumpets, the Feast of Trumpets is one of the fall feast days, right? Because we have studied that there are seven feasts. The four spring feasts, which I just mentioned were fulfilled with Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits and Pentecost. And I'm not going to go into detail because I think 
I've kind of um, elaborated on those spring feasts, but I just want to point out that those have been fulfilled. And then there's a gap between the four spring feasts and the three fall feasts. And the gap is summertime. And as I mentioned in times past, the summertime is representative of the church age because it's at that time that the farmer, after gathering wheat into, uh, from the fields and he offers the first fruit of his wheat harvest on Pentecost, he then chooses the summertime, usually a cool evening where the wind blows to winnow the wheat, representing the Holy Spirit moving within the church and removing the chaff, preparing the wheat to be brought into the storehouse of the Lord. And that will take place by the rapture, which will take place, in my opinion, on the Feast of Trumpets. And as I've always mentioned, I am not pinpointing a day for the Bible says no man knows the day nor the hour. I just truly believe that God will use this feast day in order to rapture his people so that that feast day will be fulfilled the same way the Lord used Pentecost as a day to send the Holy Spirit. And as he used the other spring feasts. Uh, as these particular days to fulfill his will and his plan of salvation. So after the Feast of Trumpets that we talked about two Sundays ago, which is the rapture of the church, the next feast, which is the Day of Atonement or Yom Kippur, that is the Jewish uh, pronunciation of the day, Kippur meaning atonement and Yom meaning day, Day of Atonement, it is the second of the fall feasts, but it's the sixth of the seven feasts. Now, being in the fall harvest, uh, or rather the fall feast uh, days, remember these feasts always are connected to harvest time. And in the springtime for uh, the first fruits which represented the resurrection of Jesus Christ, that was Jesus representing uh, his resurrection, resurrection by the harvesting of barley, which was the predominant crop. It was the early crop in Israel. And then the second uh, was the wheat harvest symbolized or fulfilled by the infilling of the Holy Spirit, those that were in the upper room. And that started the church age. And that was the harvesting of the wheat. And that continues, amen, as God still brings uh, the wheat to be winnowed during the church age. But when we get to the fall harvest, spring and summer is past. The church is now raptured, amen, at the Feast of Trumpets. And now 10 days after the Feast of Trumpets is the Day of Atonement. Now, in Israel, the predominant crops represented by the fall harvest in the context of the feasts are not wheat and barley like the summertime, but it's olives and grapes. Amen. And these crops have their own significance because we know that Israel, Paul spoke of in the book of Romans, uh, that Israel is the olive tree. Do you remember when he says that they, the children of Israel are the natural branches and the Gentile are the wild branches that are grafted in the olive tree. So the olive tree represents the nation of Israel and its branches, the olives. And the grapes is another type of harvest, but their harvest is different from olives uh, because they're two manner of fruit and the Bible gives reference in the book of Joel to what grapes represent and also in the book of Revelation. But before we go into uh, the, the harvesting of the grapes, let's look at the harvesting of the olives because if the olives are representative 
of the nation of Israel, the people of Israel, then God is going to bring in a harvest of olives. Amen. So remember, the Bible speaks of the rapture taking place. And he that letteth in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 will let until he's taken out of the way, which means that the Holy Ghost will leave uh, planet Earth um, in a manner of sense and uh, leave with the church closing the church age. And now God will then start the clock again when it comes to the nation of Israel because the clock has stopped, the eschatological clock has stopped with regard to Israel. Now, God still deals with Israel, but not as a nation. He is forming Israel uh, in order to bring her through what is known as Jacob's trouble, but the Lord has right now turned his attention to the church, which is a Gentile bride. But there are Messianic Jews. There are those Jews that believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and that are born again. And the Lord deals with them individually and not as a nation. But when the rapture takes place, the clock then begins to tick again. In other words, there was a gap. Even when Daniel spoke about the, uh, the interpretation of Nebuchadnezzar's dream, and that there is a gap between the 10 legs, or rather two legs of iron, which is the Roman Empire, and then the 10 uh, toes on the feet of iron and clay, which represents the revived Roman Empire. But between those two empires is the church age. And remember, it is through uh, the, the times of the Gentiles that Israel will be in captivity or subject to these Gentile nations until God finally overthrows uh, the times of the Gentiles, or the, rather the times of the Gentiles become fulfilled. And then Jesus then establishes his millennial kingdom, which is for a thousand years, ruling as the son of David, amen, king of kings, and Lord of Lords. But before we get to the Lord establishing his kingdom, God has to do some shaking up. God has to bring Israel through the fire. Amen. Because it's the fire that purifies. Amen. It is the fire that removes the dross. Now in the church age, God is using wind to purify us. He's using the Holy Spirit Amen. Remember, the winnow of the wheat, it is the wind that removes the chaff. But when Israel comes through the tribulation period, God has to use fire. Now, yes, in uh, the church age, the Bible speaks of believers being baptized with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Amen. But that is a spiritual fire. That is a purifying fire that is spiritual. In other words, it not only removes through the wind uh, and through the winnow process, it allows the fire to burn within our souls to remove the spiritual chaff. So in that regard, it is a spiritual fire. But in Jacob's trouble, it will be a physical fire. In other words, they will go through great trial and great tribulation in order for them to be refined and brought out as one people. Because right now they are scattered and it is through God's grace and mercy that they will come together. And we kind of see that because in 1948, the nation of Israel had become a nation again. And it's been almost 80 years since that has occurred. But be it as it may, we see that the, say, the stage is being set for Israel to go through what is known as Jacob's trouble or the tribulation period that happens after the rapture. Now, the tribulation period is important in regard to its relationship to the Day of Atonement 
because the word atonement has a special meaning. Atonement means to make reparations or to provide satisfaction for a wrong or an injury or any type of injustice. Now we've heard of the word reparations. Sometimes we've heard it in the context of slavery and how African Americans are due reparations because of the tragic institution, the horrific institution called slavery and how the descendants of slaves are entitled to receive a repair or to be given reparations for the injustice, for the injury that was caused their ancestors. Because, uh, because of slavery, there are generational strongholds that have formed, both mentally, physically, uh, uh, in terms of one's own esteem, uh, and therefore there should be compensation. So when we speak of reparations, it is the satisfaction or to be restored or made whole for an injustice or an injury. And really that is what an atonement is. It's also a repair of something that is broken. And we'll see when it comes to the harvest during this day of atonement, because remember the feast of the Lord are related to harvest. And these are the fall harvests of the olive crop as well as the grapes. Oh, hallelujah. And can I, can I preach like I teach? Uh, can I take my time to kind of uh, uh, break this down a little bit, if you will? So here we see that uh, there has to be an atonement. And the atonement takes place during Jacob's trouble, otherwise known as the tribulation period or Daniel's 70th week. Now, it begins in terms of the olives being harvested is when the two witnesses, they're even identified in the book of Revelation, I believe it's in chapter 11, they're identified, or 12, they're identified as two olive trees. And we uh, speculate that uh, these two olive trees, these two witnesses are Elijah and Moses. Now, we don't know for sure whether it's Moses, but we do know that Elijah is one of them because the scriptures foretell uh, that Elijah would return as a messenger before the great and terrible day of the Lord. And you'll find that in the book of Malachi. But when we look in Revelation chapter 11, we see in verse three, the word says, and I will give power unto my two witnesses and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days clothed in sackcloth. Now a thousand two hundred and three score days or 1260 days is three and a half years. Just divide 1260 by 30 days, which is a Jewish month, not like our 31 days, but a Jewish month is 30 days. It comes out to three and a half years. In other words, during the first half of the tribulation period, these two witnesses will be on the scene. They will be known as the olive trees. Oh, glory. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. And they will come on the scene at the start of the tribulation period, which is three and a half years. Now, they will begin after the Feast of Trumpets, because remember, on the Feast of Trumpets, we learned a couple of weeks ago that no man knows the day nor the hour. But there are always two witnesses that look for the new moon. And when the new moon is cited by these two witnesses, they are then to go into Jerusalem to tell the elders of the church that the Feast of Trumpets has begun. And what these two witnesses in Revelation will do 
is that when the rapture takes place at the Feast of Trumpets, hallelujah, thank you, Jesus, they will then go into Jerusalem to tell the nation of Israel and the world that the rapture has taken place, that God has taken his people out of the earth. And now there will then be a covenant established by the Antichrist. And that covenant will begin the clock of the tribulation period. Now, I don't know if that clock begins a day after the Feast of Trumpets or the rapture, or if it's a three days or a week, but we do know that the tribulation period begins when the covenant of the Antichrist is established with the nation of Israel. And these two witnesses will go into Jerusalem and throughout the world telling the world that Jesus has already come and he has taken his church and he and they will prophesy that Jesus will come after in seven years to establish his kingdom and the kingdom of heaven will be preached. Amen. Remember, the kingdom of heaven is the messianic rule of Jesus Christ. That's why Matthew always talked about the kingdom of heaven, because it was Jesus kingdom where he sits on the throne and earth has a heavenly king ruling in the world. Oh, glory. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. So these two olive trees are going to go out into Israel and preach to the Jews. And because they are olive trees through the anointed message, they will be shaking the branches. You know, when you harvest olives, there is a shaking that has to be done in order for the olives to fall. And the Bible speaks of God using the Holy Spirit to seal, amen, the 144,000 in Revelation chapter 7. And with the preaching of the two witnesses and combined with the evangelism of the 144,000, 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes, there will be a great shaking of the olive tree, which represents Israel. And the olives will begin to fall. Hallelujah. Why? Because God wants to harvest the olives. Amen. And that is where you make olive oil, right? Amen. When you have olive and you press it, you make olive oil, and olive oil is symbolic of the Holy Spirit. So through the power of God, through the preaching of these witnesses and the 144,000, the olives will be reaped, amen. They will be harvested and put into the Lord's oil press known as the tribulation period, and it will be through the hard time, the pressing, amen, of great tribulation, that the Holy Spirit, oh glory, hallelujah, will be received, that they will finally understand and believe that Jesus is Lord of Lords and King of Kings, and they will then be atoned for their sins. Why? Because a spirit of supplication, when they see Jesus come through the trackless sky, they will see, amen, the nail prints in his hands. They'll see the nail prints in his feet. They'll see the wound in his side. And they'll come to understand that they rejected him and that they allowed the Romans to crucify him. Amen. And they'll be weeping. Oh, hallelujah. But God will give them the gift of repentance. And at that time, there will be an atonement. Amen. And the nation of Israel will be saved. Oh, hallelujah. But they got to go through the press. God's oil press, amen, where he will gather the olives together as a result of the preaching of the gospel that the kingdom of heaven, oh, hallelujah, is at hand. But there will be those that will, amen, be shaken, amen, and the olives harvested through the preaching. But then there will be those that will be pressed through the demonic forces that will take place uh, in the world. I'm not even going to go into the locusts being let out of the bottomless pit. 
But if you read Revelation chapter 6, you will see that Jesus will break open seven seals. And in those seals, there will be destructive forces, amen, that will cause people, amen, to turn their hearts to God. Oh, hallelujah. Remember, they got to go through the fire. They got to be purified. They got to go through Jacob's trouble because they missed the Messiah on the first of occasion. They were supposed to receive the atonement then. And I'm going to go into that in a little while. But because they missed the atonement from the cross, they got to go through the atonement during the tribulation period. Oh, hallelujah. And when we get to Revelation chapter 14, the Bible speaks about the harvest. Oh, glory, hallelujah, because John mentions that he sees a man that is sitting on a cloud likened unto the Son of Man, and he heard an angel to tell him that it's time now to take a sickle that is in his hand and for him to thrust it into the earth. Why? Because the harvest is ripe. In verse 14 of chapter 14, come on, take your time with me now. It says, and I looked and behold, a white cloud and upon the cloud, one sat like unto the son of man, having on his head a golden crown. Now, you know who that is. That's nobody else but Jesus. And in his hand, a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud. So this angel comes out of, amen, out of heaven, and then it, with a cry to Jesus, tells the Lord, thrust in thy sickle and reap, for the time is come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. And then the Bible says in verse 16, and he that sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. All right, now that refers to olives. Now it doesn't specify that, but what I'm about to read is another harvest in verse 17. And remember, I said in the beginning, there's an olive harvest, and there is a grape harvest in the fall feast, just like in the spring feast, there's the barley harvest, and the wheat harvest, representing two types of harvest. The barley representing Jesus' resurrection, and the wheat representing the resurrection of those in the church. Amen. The wheat being gathered. Oh, hallelujah. But now in verse 17, it says, And another angel came out of the temple, which is in heaven, he also having a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar, which had power over the fire, and cried with a loud cry to him that heart had the sharp sickle. Now, this is another angel crying to another angel, not Jesus, because Jesus has a sickle for another type of harvest. This is another angel talking to another angel that has a sharp sickle, and he's telling him to thrust in the sharp sickle and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth for her grapes are fully ripe. So now this particular thrusting of the sickle is to harvest the grapes, not the olives. Jesus is going to harvest the olives because the olives represent the people of God, the nation of Israel. And it is through Israel that Jesus will rule over. But the grapes are in a different category. Grapes, amen, uh, are a different type of harvest. And we're going to see what that is. And it says in verse 19, And the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and cast it into the great winepress of what? The wrath of God. And the wine press was trodden without the city, and blood came out of the wine press, even unto the horse bridles, by the space of a thousand and six hundred furlongs. So, what is this referring to? The grapes are different from the olives because the olives are in an olive press, 
and the product from an olive press is olive oil, which represents an anointing oil or the Holy Spirit. However, what do you get when you get grapes that are pressed in a wine press? You get wine, and wine is symbolic of blood. That's why we, when we take the Lord's Supper, it is his body and the wine is his blood. And remember, we're talking about the Day of Atonement, where there has to be payment made. And for those that will receive the gospel of the kingdom of heaven, meaning Jesus is coming back a second time, they will be in the olive harvest. But for those that reject him, they will be in the wine press of the wrath of God. Oh, hallelujah. That's why Joel speaks of the grapes being gathered in the wine press for the grapes and the wine press of God is fat and full. And it speaks of these grapes being thrown in a wine press. And that's why Isaiah said, who is this that came from Edom with dyed garments from Bozrah? It is the Lord traveling in the salvation and the strength of his own might. Oh, hallelujah. And his garments are stained with the blood of those that were his enemies. And that's a paraphrase. Hallelujah. So that scripture coincides with the wrath of God and how the grapes that are representing those who reject Jesus. And when we look at verse 20, it speaks that the wine press, when they are trodden without the city, that the blood is going to come up to the horse's bridle. So what is it saying here? It's speaking of the battle of Armageddon, that after the tribulation period, Jesus is coming, not on a donkey. Amen. Jesus is coming, not as a servant, but Jesus is coming as a conquering king, and he's coming on his white horse. Oh, hallelujah. And you're going to have the armies of the world that's going to gather in the valley of Jehoshaphat, in the Jezreel Valley. And all of the armies will come to battle and to come against God's anointed, which is the people of Israel. And Israel is going to cry out to God and ask God to save them from a slaughter. And the Bible speaks of Jesus returning. And when he returns, not only is he going to destroy the Antichrist and the false prophet with the brightness of his coming, but the Bible says that there'll be hailstones that's going to fall from heaven. That's why when God was questioning Job, he said, Job, where were you? And where is the treasures of snow and ice stored? in the heavens reserved for the day of judgment. I'm here to tell you that judgment is going to come after a while. Payment has to be made. <laughs> Hallelujah. That's why the Lord says recompense not evil with evil. Amen. But recompense evil with good. For in turn, you heat hot coals of fire upon that person's head. Why? Because vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I shall repay. So one day Jesus is coming back and he's coming back with vengeance. He's coming back, amen, to pay, amen, pay back for all those that rejected him and that crucified him. And if you're not part of the nation of Israel, gathered into the oil press or into the olive harvest, then you're going to be grapes gathered into the wine press of God. So when the hailstones begin to fall from earth, the Bible says it will squash all the armies in Armageddon like grapes. And the blood is going to gush out Oh, hallelujah. And it will go to the horse's bridle. Amen. And at that time, it will be, as I mentioned, Israel receiving the atonement of Jesus Christ. But you know, we, as Paul said, receive the atonement 
already. Don't you know that when Jesus came the first time and when he died on the cross, he was fulfilling the Passover as the Passover lamb. Now, but he also was fulfilling the day of atonement now, for those that believe in him. Now, because the day of atonement now, was a day now, that the high priest now, had to go into the temple, now, into the holy place, if you will. Now, and in the holy place, now, you have the holies of holies. Now, where the mercy seat was, now, over the Ark of the Covenant, now, and where the Ten Commandments, now, on tablets of sapphire laid, now, and were stored, now, and two cherubims, now, with outstretched arms, now, was in the midst of the Ark, now, forming the mercy seat, now, for the invisible God, now, and God instructed Moses, now, I want you to tell Aaron, now, that on the day of atonement, now, will only be once a year, now, because it's a day, now, to come for the sins of Israel, now, I want Aaron to take off his helmet, now, I want him to take off his breastplate, now, take off the beautiful things, now, that they normally, now, come into the holy place with, now, and instead, now, it's a time to afflict your soul, now, so I want all the fancy clothes off, Aaron, now, I want you to come just with a linen garment, now, come in humility, now, because you're coming on behalf, now, of the people of Israel, now, and when you come to God, now, you got to come humbly, now, yes, it says come boldly, now, but you come boldly with humility, now, asking for repentance, now, saying, Lord, now, I'm sorry for my sins, now, oh, hallelujah, now, so Aaron, now, had to come into the holy place. Now, but he also had to offer now, a lamb for himself. Now, he had to be covered now, under the blood. Now, the altar had to be anointed. Now, the altar of incense now, and the altar of burnt offering. Now, all of it had to be consecrated. Now, because God now, is a holy God. Now, he said, be holy. Now, for I am holy. Now, so I need the blood. Now, to cover you, Aaron. Now, when you come into my presence. Now, for when I see the blood. Now, when I see the blood. Now, I will pass. Now, I will pass over you. Now, oh, hallelujah. Now, someone sang the song. Now, I'm going to stay under the blood. Now, where the world can't do me no harm. Now, no harm. Now, no harm. Now, I'm going to stay right under the blood. Now, oh, hallelujah. Now, so after Aaron, now, offers the sacrifice. Now, for his own behalf. Now, he had to bring two kid goats. Now, one goat. Now, a lot was cast. Now, and the lot was cast. Now, as the Lord's goat. Now, and that goat. Now, was sacrificed. Now, on the altar of burnt offering. Now, but then the second goat. Now, Aaron. Now, and all of the priests. Now, laid hands on that goat. Now, laying on all the sins. Now, of the people of Israel, now, on the head of the lamb, now, or rather on the head of the goat, now, all of the iniquities, now, all their backbiting, now, all their lying, now, all their stealing, now, had to be, now, placed on that goat, now, and that goat, now, was led out of the temple, now, out of the camp, of Israel now oh hallelujah now which symbolize 
Christ. Now, Jesus, now, taking our sins away. Now, oh, glory. Now, but we don't have to wait once a year. Now, we can have our sins taken away. Now, every day. Now, every time you say sorry. Now, when you recognize you did something wrong. Now, Christ, Christ already died. Now, and paid the price. Now, for your atonement. Now, he paid it all. Now, summed up in the cross. Now, the cross of Calvary. Now, for the cross of Calvary. Now, was outside. Now, the walls of Jerusalem. Now, all God got this hill. Now, so not only was Jesus the Lamb of God, now, he was also the scapegoat, now, to take our sins away, now, but you know what, now, he is also a high priest, now, he offered himself, now, as the scapegoat, now, just like he offered himself, now, as the Lamb of God, now, don't you know, now, that's why, now, the wise men, now, I know this ain't Christmas, now, but the wise men, now, gave him gold, now, frankincense, now, and myrrh, now, representing, now, his high priestly office, now, but Jesus, now, didn't have to offer a lamb, now, for himself, now, for he was a lamb, now, without spot or blemish, now, a scapegoat, now, with no imperfections, now, no need, now, to sacrifice, now, any animal, now, for his sins, now, for he knew no sin, now, for he was perfect, now, in all his ways, now, not born of man, now, but born of the Holy Ghost, now, oh, now, born, now, of the Spirit, now, oh, hallelujah, now, thank you, Jesus, now, so he is the high priest, now, offering himself, now, as the scapegoat, now, allowing the elders, now, to bring them outside the camp, now, to be crucified, now, for our atonement, now, you see the Jews, now, could have believed on him right there, now, and the day of atonement, now, would have been fulfilled, now, but because they rejected him, now, it delayed, now, the fall harvest, now, it delayed, now, the fulfillment, now, of the feast of the fall harvest, now, and now, now, that delay, now, grafted us in, now, uh, now, hallelujah, now, grafted us, now, wild olive branches, now, wheat, now, the first fruits, now, of the spirit, now, oh, hallelujah, now, there is summertime, now, the gap age, now, the age of the church, now, because we believe, now, in the atonement work, now, of Jesus Christ, now, but we don't have to wait every year, now, we can cry right now, now, David said, now, this poor man cried, now, in the Lord, now, delivered me from all my troubles, now, it's time to cry, now, it's time to say, Lord, now, have mercy, now, it's time to say, Jesus, now, let your blood prevail, now, oh, now, oh, hallelujah, thank you, Jesus, now, thank Jesus, now, for his blood, now, thank him, now, for the atonement, now, he paid it all, now, I have no debts, now, because he paid my bill, now, for the wages of sin, now, in death, now, but the gift of God, now, is eternal life, now, thank you, Jesus, now, for a second chance.
chance them. No, a chance to get it right. No, a chance to repent them. No, a chance to make it. No, oh, hallelujah. No, come on and praise him. No, if Jesus paid your bill, no, you ought to praise him. No, I posted this week. No, that Jesus paid your bill. No, and he got changed back. No, but the change he got back no, was your change. No, change from a sinful life. No, for if any man be in Christ, no, he is a new creature. No, oh, things no, are passed away. No, behold, all things no, become new. No, change. No, I don't talk the way I used to talk. No, I don't walk. No, the way I used to walk. No, change. No, change. No, Jesus change. No, soul change. No, thank you, Lord. No, for paying my debt. No, Jesus. No, you paid it all. No, oh, glory, hallelujah. No, what shall I render? No, unto the Lord. No, for all his benefits. No, what shall I render? No, what shall I give? No, for God. No, has everything. No, and everything belongs to him. No, God. No, has everything. No, and everything belongs to him. No, Lord. No, shall I render? No, tell me what? No, shall I give? No, well, David said, No, what shall I render to the Lord? No, for all his benefits toward me. No, I am. No, I am. No, I am. No, shall take the cup. No, of salvation. No, and call. No, Call, no, call, no, upon the name of the Lord, no, call on his name, no, Jesus, no, Jesus, no, Jesus, no, the best thing no, that ever happened to me, no, Jesus, no, you are, no, the center of my joy, no, oh, oh, oh glory, no, glory, hallelujah. No, thank you, Jesus. No, for paying it all. No, come on and put your hands together and give them the praise. <laughs> Shalom. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you. <laughs> oh, thank you, Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Jesus, he paid it all. Hey, hallelujah. Oh, thank you. And for those that don't know the Lord, Jesus Christ, he has paid it all for you. And all you have to do is the word says is to be born again. And that is being born of the water and of the spirit. Hallelujah. And in Acts 2.38, it tells us plainly to repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For this promise, this promise is unto you, his word says, and unto your children and your children's children. And as many a far off as the Lord our God has called. Oh, hallelujah. Let the Lord fill you with his spirit. He already paid the price. You just have to accept it through faith and through the obedience of his word. Because he paid the price not only for your death, <clears throat> but for every sin you have committed and for the nature of sin. That was in your in your body. Hallelujah. And for any future sin, he is the atonement. You don't have to wait for Yom Kippur 
He already gave the atonement on the cross when they crucified him. Hallelujah. Outside the camp on Golgotha's hill. So through the cross, you receive not only the Passover lamb that takes care of your eternal death and satisfy that wage, but also for any sins you committed and will commit because he atoned for that. The nation of Israel had to do it every year for their sins as a nation. But you as an individual just need to receive it through the blood of Jesus Christ as the atonement. And just ask the Lord for forgiveness when you do the wrong thing. You want to be gathered as wheat into God's storehouse when he takes his church home. You don't want to be with, here where the fall harvest take place. Because either there's the olives, which represent the nation of Israel, and even all of them will not be saved. Or you're going to be in the harvest of the grapes, which goes into the wine press of God's wrath, because there will be atonement by the wine press, press as payback or reparations for the evil. And then there will be atonement when the olive harvest, which is Israel, repents and receives the atonement through Jesus, who they rejected but they now have the spirit of supplication to receive him and thereby receive the atonement as a nation. Hallelujah. But those two crops in the fall harvest still have to go through the tribulation period. And it speaks of the angels crying one to Jesus to thrust in his sickle and the other angel cries to another angel to thrust in his sickle to the wine press. That's why Jesus said in his Olivet Discourse, when he talked about separating, uh, not just in his Olivet Discourse, but when he spoke about the parable of the wheat and tares, he said in that day, he said, leave them alone. In that day, he will send his angels to reap. It, that's what Revelation 14 is. It's the fulfillment of the angels bringing about the reaping of the harvest during the tribulation period. The separation between the people of God and the evil generation. But in the tribulation period, it will be olives and it will be grapes. Hallelujah. Now, some believe that it will be wheat and grapes. But in the fall, there's not a wheat harvest. There's an olive uh, harvest that has to be gathered. But in any event, you don't want to be in either harvest. You want to be in the wheat harvest. Hallelujah. In the summertime being winnowed for when the Feast of Trumpets is sound, he's taking his wheat to glory. Amen. Well, God bless you. Heaven smile upon you. I hope these messages are edifying and beneficial. I know um, it's, it's a lot of teaching, but I think teaching is important. So not, not just for one occasion, but go back to the recordings as they're on Facebook and hear it over again. Amen. Learn about the feasts of the Lord in Leviticus chapter 23, the seven feasts and what they represent and the tie-in of their fulfillment. Amen? Of their fulfillment. Amen? All right. Look forward to seeing you on next Sunday, God willing. And thank you for those that, again, are sending contributions. The way that you can do so is through Catch App, and that's dollar sign in heavenly places. It's listed on the video, uh, the actual Cash App name. For those that have sent mail, and also contributions. You're much appreciated. It's at In Heavenly Places with Elder Marcus Brantley, 975 East Riggs Road, Suite 12 170, and that's Chandler, Arizona, 85249. Amen. So 
Let's have a word of prayer. Father, in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, we thank you. We praise you. We thank you for what's been said and done. Lord God, we thank you for your word. Count us worthy to escape, oh God, the wrath that is to be on this world. Father, we thank you for paying it all. You paid all our debts and we are so glad. Hallelujah. Oh, we praise and magnify your name. Bless each and every one that has heard this message. Oh God, give them restful peace tonight and help them to start their week, whether it be at work or at home. Whatever they have chosen to do, we ask that you be even in the midst. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. See you on next Sunday. God willing, shalom, shalom. Be blessed.